revolution other and we in 1802, she was initially married to Daniel Park Custis, who was a rich plantation owner in 1749. The couple had four children. Two of them, Jack and Betsy, actually lived past childhood. Custis himself died in the summer of 1757. Martha Washington then inherits his 15,000-acre estate, including slaves. She later meets Colonel George Washington at a Williamsburg cotillion, which is basically a dance party, you know, the, the colonial edition of a rave, if you will. They get married in 1759. Martha and her children move to Mount Vernon, which is George Washington's plantation, where a family becomes known for their social events and upscale lifestyle, though they suffered financial setbacks as well. Going back to our first History for Shut-Ins episode, when we talked about the way that the colonial economy was set up, especially south of the Mason-Dixon line, rich landowners would sell their harvest for goods, for slaves, for whatever it may be. And when I talk about goods, I'm talking about European goods. So, so many times, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, some of the leading founding fathers actually went into debt because they bought goods on debt against their harvest. If their harvest was bad, then they've already purchased the goods and now they're going into debt. It goes on and on and on. By 1775, George Washington becomes the leader of U.S. forces in the American Revolution. And going back to yesterday, it was John Adams who initially recommends Washington, knowing how important it is to have somebody from Virginia leading all forces. Martha Washington takes up residence with George at the various encampments in Boston, in New York, actually out at Valley Forge as well. She, as I mentioned, she experienced, you know, terrible heartache with the loss of her surviving children. Patsy died from epilepsy during her teens, and Jack succumbed to what was called camp fever while enlisted as a soldier. Early in the revolution, and, and the same thing happens really in almost any war, especially the Civil War as well, is that more soldiers die from disease than they do from battle wounds. And especially in the American Revolution, you have farm boys who are being exposed to perhaps those who live in New York, Boston, and they're pathogen of death from disease or even once they're wounded, you know, from infection, whatever it may be. And it's not until later in the war, until about a year or two in, when Baron von Steuben comes to Valley Forge and trains the various soldiers, colonial soldiers, not only drills them, but talks about sanitation and really things that we take for granted today. Um, so you see a lot of that early in the in the Revolutionary War. What happens is as First Lady, and remember, the term First Lady was not used until 1838 when a book is written about Martha Washington. She is actually called Lady Washington when George is president. But as First Lady, she takes on the responsibility of arranging major social events and parties for the president, both at his home and in the presidential office in New York. And much like George, who we're gonna talk about next, setting precedent as president, Martha does the same thing as first lady. Martha wasn't nearly as involved in political discussions as Admiral Adams we discussed yesterday. Martha took more of a back seat, if you will, in political discourse, but she was very involved in social interactions while George is president. 
she would hold Friday public receptions and handled household affairs for George, you know, basically taking care of Vernon. And she became very close with Abigail Adams. Martha Washington was seen as a gracious presence and looked to Europe for inspiration in terms of setting standards for official affairs, though it was noted she often felt overwhelmed by these trappings, if you will, by the social interaction. And think of it from this perspective as well. George Washington, especially after the revolution, is one of the most intimidating people, both physically, because he's tall, he's broad, he's you know, in shape, but also because of what he has accomplished. He's been deified after the American Revolution, rightfully so. So being in his presence, even with Martha, he overshadows everybody. So that's an issue here. But Martha holds on to her slate after her death, though the slaves that Washington, George Washington held, were freed upon his death. Uh, and Washington, as getting older, takes on more of an abolitionist stance. Um, upon taking ill early in 1802, remember George dies in 1799, and we'll talk about that next. Martha outlives him by a few years. She dies in 1802. She writes her will and burns most of the letters between her and George. Unlike John and Abigail Adams, who kept all of their correspondence, uh, which really helped historians later, George and Martha burned everything because they were afraid of how they would be re reviewed or seen uh, posthumously. So Martha, the big thing that Martha does is while George is you know, leading the revolution, while he's president, she is tending to affairs at Mount Vernon, which is very important. And remember, we've talked about this. There was a big role that women played in the revolution, taking on more male roles, if you will. George Washington, born in 1732, dies in 1799, is one of my favorite people to talk about. I, as crazy as this sounds, I don't think he gets enough credit. Yes, he's on the dollar bill. Yes, he's the father of our country. Yes, he's on Mount Rushmore. Yes, there are states. There's a state named after him. There are counties, I believe, in almost every state named after George Washington. On and on and on. But I feel that he is taken for granted in some respects and then, of course, overshadowed uh, a bit by Abraham Lincoln, rightfully so, perhaps, because of the challenges that he faced during his presidency. But Washington, what, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm really going to talk about his time during the Revolution. In June of 1775, as the Continental Congress is meeting, Washington shows up to Congress in his uniform that he wore during the French and Indian War 20 years earlier. And he, he is very big on speaking without using words. So he shows up and he's telling his congressional peers, I'm the guy who should lead the army. And again, it's John Adams who really pushes that idea as well as George, although not verbally. Nice, Jack. Good taste. We'll talk about that flag in a little bit. Um, so despite little experience in many large conventional armies, Washington proves to be an extremely capable and resilient leader of military forces. Throughout the war, and we'll talk about an episode next, Washington actually takes some heat because he's not, he, he loses more battles in the Revolutionary War than he wins. And Congress is sniping at him. He's got to deal with Congress. At the time of the revolution, state governors have more power than Congress because remember, we don't have a national government yet. So Washington is dealing with 13 separate governments as well as Congress in asking for manpower and 
food and supplies and on and on and on. Some of the bigger states actually withhold items that Washington is asking for, which hurts recruitment and things of the like. Washington, however, even though he lost more battles than he won, he knows he can't go toe to toe with the British, not until the French come in and assist us after the Battle of Saratoga. But Washington employs a winning strategy that includes huge victories, Battle of Trenton in 1776, Christmas night into actually the next morning. Also, York 1781. So yes, he loses other battles, but he wins the big important ones. Washington's greatest wartime legacy was his decision to surrender his commission to Congress, affirming the principle of civilian control over the military in the United States. Think of other precedents, if you will. Think of Caesar. Think of, and this is now after Washington, think of Napoleon. What happens there? And we'll talk about Washington resigning his commission. I'll also post a great article written by Thomas Fleming about 15 years ago in the Wall Street Journal on Washington surrendering his commission. It's phenomenal stuff. So the first thing we'll talk about is the Newburgh conspiracy, as in Newburgh, New York. Without the power to tax, under the Articles of Confederation, Congress really relies on irregular voluntary payments from the states as well as loans from the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, on and on and on. So Washington is trying to piece together this ragtag army and remember it initially is state militias before it becomes a true army. So he's got a lot of things happening. Officers and soldiers are not being paid for their service. And remember, as Washington is losing more battles than he is winning, soldiers are saying, you know what, I'm just going home. I'm not being paid. This is not working out well. I'm going to go back and tend to my farm. I'm okay being an Englishman and supporting the king. The army it was often forced to requisition supplies and food from wherever they were encamped. In Valley Forge that winter, they actually go around to surround farms. And some of the farmers say, I'm not going to give you anything, one, because I can't. And two, how are you paying me? You're writing me an IOU. That's not, you know, I can't use this. So he has those sorts of issues. In 1780, Congress passed a, rev a resolution providing half pay for re retired soldiers. As of 1783, the states had yet to comply with Congress's request. In 1784, you have a group of nationalists in Congress led by the Superintendent of Finance for the United States, Robert Morris, who we will talk about either today or in Monday's uh, session, his assistant, Governor Morris, and Alexander Hamilton. And they all supported an amendment to the Articles of Confederation, which would allow Congress to raise money through taxes to support the army and to pay its foreign loans. It's not until after the revolution that this takes place, and it's really with Alexander Hamilton's pushing it. State legislatures basically tell Congress to go jump a lake. Because again, governors of states have so much more power than Congress does. So that's why the Articles of Confederation, states liked it because they have more power. The governors do. As the British threat subsides following the war's legal or last major engagement, which is the Battle of Yorktown in October of 1781, the states became even more reluctant to fulfill Congress's requisitions for the army. By late 1782, many in the Northern Army encamped at Newburgh, New York, feared that Congress would never meet their obligations. So hoping to intimidate Congress, and Congress was so fearful of a standing army, because again, the precedent has been in history, for the most part, once an army is victorious, they then go after the government, and you have a a military dictatorship. 
So Congress Congress that's so unrest and saying, hey, you guys have power. You've just beaten the most feared army and navy on the earth. You ought to come after Congress because when the British occupied the city of Philadelphia, Congress ran as fast as they could to the central part of, of Pennsylvania, to York and to Lancaster. So on March 10th, 1784, a meeting of officers is anonymously called for the following day in camp at Newburgh. And a, a, an address is written, a pretty inflammatory address is written, which is circulated, and it's basically calling for the end of Washington's rule. And what they want is they want General Horatio Gates to take over. Uh, uh, an aide-de-camp to Gates, Major John Armstrong writes the address. The address asked the men to abandon the moderate tone of Washington's entreaties to Congress in favor of a forceful ultimatum. If Congress doesn't comply, the address states the army should threaten to either disband or refuse to disband after a peace treaty ending the war is signed. So again, a military takeover. The camp is electrified, saying, oh, my gosh, what the heck do we do here? So on the next day, Washington, on the 11th, Washington's general orders basically say this meeting is improper. You can't hold it. What he wants to do is basically have a cooling off period. So he says, let's have a meeting in four days on the 15th of March to discuss the matters. And he says or he implies that he will not join the meeting so as the meeting starts and this is his classic the officers are gathered and gates steps forward to chair the proceedings however washington enters the room interrupts gates unexpectedly and says i would like to address the meeting he says the message sent by armstrong wrong. We cannot do this. Think of all the sacrifice. We've won this war. We can't go this route. So Washington implores the troops to, quote, give one more distinguished proof of unexampled patriotism and patient virtue, unquote, by placing their, quote, full confidence in the purity of the intentions of Congress, unquote, which, of course, today we would probably laugh at. However, Washington then says, I just have a message that I would like to read. And it's a, so a recent letter from a congressman saying, we have your back. We will make right on the promises that we have made. So as, as Washington is stumbling through the speech, what he does is he takes a pair of glasses. And again, classic Washington takes, takes a pair of, sp of spectacles out of his coat and he puts them on. And he says to his troops, he says, gentlemen, you must pardon me, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in service to my country, unquote. What would the kids call that today? A mic drop. The disarming vulnerability of Washington actually makes soldiers in the room cry, weep openly, and they say, Everything that Washington has sacrificed for the establishment of our independence, and we're now bickering with Congress about pay. Needless to say, that was it. That ended the meeting and that ended talk of, of a coup, basically, or military takeover. Washington scores one of his greatest triumphs with words, with, without you know, the gun, without a cannon and completely disarms and diffuses the situation. We'll move forward to him resigning his military commission. And again, I will post a link to a Wall Street Journal article by Thomas Fleming on this. It's phenomenal stuff. Washington, he's on his way home after the revolution. He's on his way home for Christmas to Mount Vernon. He stops in Annapolis where Congress is meeting, and he starts with, quote, as 
in their meeting to resign his commission. Quote, happy in the confirmation of our inter independence and sovereignty and pleased with the opportunity afforded the United States of becoming a respectable nation, I resign with satisfaction the appointment I accepted with diffidence, a diffidence in my abilities to accomplish so arduous a task, which however was superseded by a confidence in the rectitude of our cause, the support of the supreme power of the union and the patronage of heaven. So Washington is saying, here's my sword. I am out of the military. I'm resigning my commission. And Congress, you are now in charge. This is similar to a contemporary example. If you think of Gladiator, Washington, one of his historical icons and figures that he loved was a Roman general by the name of Cincinnatus, for whom the city of Cincinnati is named. Cincinnati basically was Russell Crowe. Sorry for any, uh, you know, any offense anybody takes historically here. But Cincinnati is a farmer. He is, you know, he's resigned from the, the Rush or the Roman army. He's called out of retirement to lead the Roman legions in a victory. When he wins, he says, I just want to go home. This is George Washington. He's won the revolution. He's arguably, not arguably, he's the most powerful man in the colonies. And he says, I'm done. I want to go home. When King George hears about this, he says, Washington is indeed a great man. And again, it sets the precedent for civilian control of the military and, and control of the government as well. Washington finishes up with, quote, having now finished the work assigned to me, I retire from the great theater of action and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under whose orders I have so long acted. I here offer my commission and take any leave of all the employments of public life." Unquote. Little did he know that he would be lassoed by Alexander Hamilton to serve as president in about five years. But truly, we are fortunate that Washington was our leader during the revolution. Otherwise, things could have ended much differently because somebody more greedy who wants power would not have resigned it. Next person that we are going to talk about, we are going to talk about Ben Franklin. So in 1754, at a meeting of colonial representatives, representatives in Albany, Franklin proposes a plan for uniting the colony under a national congress. Although it was rejected, it helped lay the groundwork for the Articles of Confederation which although imperfect, was a stepping stone to the Constitution. The flag behind me, I'm going to get out of the way. This flag behind me, join or die, this was made, this cartoon was published by Franklin at the Albany Conference. And the point being, we are stronger united than we are separate, hence 13 different sections of the snake. So it's through Franklin that this idea starts to take form. Now, of course, in 1754, they are not talking about independence, but they also are saying we need a joint Congress. We can't have 13 individual colonies worried about their own self-interest. We are only as strong as our weakest link. So that's what Washington, or pardon me, that's what Franklin is going after here. The Albany plan, as I said, it wasn't conceived out of a desire for independence, but more as a means to reform colonial imperial relations, which are starting to go downhill. The Seven Years' War is going on at this time. What you see is many of the uh, colonial commissioners, they actually want to increase the power that the British authority has. However, there are a lot of issues that they need to work out. So the plan is shot down because colonial governments of each state are afraid that they're actually going to lose power. 
So that's why they deny the Albany plan at this meeting. In 1766, pardon me, Franklin testifies in Parliament against the Stamp Act. Although the act was repealed in 66, there are additional regulations that are put through. The Townsend Acts, the Intolerable Acts that we've talked about earlier. And of course, it increases anti-British sentiment and eventual law eventual eventual easy for me to say armed uprising by colonists the boston massacre the boston tea party and such by 1772 as an agent for four u.s colonial assemblies franklin had been living in london for 15 years franklin considered himself an englishman first a colonist second he is one of the most famous men in the world because of his various experiments. Um, Franklin made his mark as a printer, as a scientist, as an author, as an inventor, as a diplomat, a true Renaissance man. He is appointed deputy postmaster general of the Royal Post in the colonies. He actually increases or improves the speed, increases it in which mail is delivered. Uh, the Royal Society of London makes Franklin the first non-Brit to be awarded their highest gold achievement, award, which is the Copley Medal, C-O-P-L-E-Y. Franklin, as Postmaster General, has access to the mail, of course. He secretly passes secret British government documents to a small group of leaders in Boston. The Adamses, John Hancock, and the like. The aim was to show them, the leaders in Boston, that the instigation of bad feelings between the colonies and the British didn't stem from Parliament. The main troublemaker was Governor Hutchinson, who we discussed earlier. He had been feeding bad advice back to the British, saying, hey, we have all these problems. Where is Hutchinson, the governor? Massachusetts. Massachusetts is a hotbed of, of, it, of course. December 2nd of 1772, Franklin sends a packet of letters to Thomas Cushing, who is Speaker of the Ma Massachusetts Assembly. Six of the letters had been written by Hutchinson to British ministers years earlier. Franklin's letter to Cushing says, quote, or pardon me, says, quote, there has lately fallen into my hands part of a correspondence that I have reason to believe laid the foundation of most, if not all, our present grievances, unquote. He says, do not make these public. Of course, there is with Sam Adams, John Adams, John Hancock, this is like blood in the water for sharks. What do they do? They publish the letters. In one of the letters, there is a quote, and they called it, you know, we heard the shot heard in the world with Lexington and Concord. This is the sound bite heard around the world. Hutchinson writes, quote, there must be an abridgment of what are called English liberties, unquote, in the colonies. The identity of Franklin as the source of the letters is hidden. Although the the Brits are trying to uncover, as our loyalists, the United States was outraged. The, the colonists are, of course, outraged by the letters. By mid 1773, King George III receives a petition from the Massachusetts Assembly to have Hutchinson and Oliver, remember the who was collecting taxes, removed from their governmental positions. Because the position was not one of criminal accusation, but rather a strongly worded request to the British Board of Trade, George III refers the petition over to his advisory board, the Privy Council. Through the last half of 1773, London newspapers are going bananas, almost like the National Enquirer, saying, here's who... who 
you know, publish these letters. And of course, they're going with the usual suspects, but they don't mention Franklin initially. The accusations become so heated that in December of 1773, you have a loyalist and a patriot in Boston duel over who's, who had written the letters. When the loyalist is slightly injured, he, he says to the patriot, when I recover, we're going to do this again. When Franklin hears this, he says, Okay, enough's enough. On December 25th of 1773, in an editorial in the London Chronicle, Franklin takes the blame, the responsibility for publishing these letters. He said that the letters, quote, were written by public officers to persons in public stations on public affairs and that their tendency was to incense the mother country against her colonies and by the steps recommended to widen the breach, unquote. So that, that's Franklin's reasoning for having these letters published. Franklin uh, arrives at the Whitehall Chamber of the Privy Council. Remember, the king has sent the Privy Council the request to oust Hutchinson and Oliver. The Privy Council is going to debate the merits of the petition. Where the debate takes place, it's called the cockpit. Because earlier, during King Henry VIII's reign, cockfights actually took place in this meeting area. So instead of hearing Franklin's petition defense, the Solicitor General of the Lord North Ministry, Lord North is anything but a fan of the Collins, the Solicitor General, his name is Alexander Wedderburn, he lights Franklin up like a Christmas tree with an attack that accuses Franklin of illegally receiving and disclosing private correspondence. Franklin, of course, is taken aback because he said, we're supposed to be meeting to talk about Hutchinson and Oliver, and you're here lighting me up. So Franklin says in polite sarcasm that he had misinterpreted the reason he had been called the Privy Council he asked for a lawyer. The Privy Council agrees he should have representation and set their next meeting for the 29th of January, 1774. With parliamentary feelings going through the roof, seeing Franklin as an incendiary agent on the 19th of January, there's a British ship called the Haley, H-A-Y-L-E-Y. It sails into Boston Harbor carrying news of the Boston Tea Party. The ministers decide, or it sailed from Boston, pardon me. The ministers say at that point, we have to make an example out of Franklin. On the 29th of January, the petition for the removal of Hutchinson and Oliver is read out loud. Franklin has two lawyers there, with his lead attorney being a man by the name of John Dunning. Dunning is sick, and he can barely be heard. What Dunning had to say in response to the petition didn't matter because Wedderburn had his marching orders from the king and from parliament, and again, it was to make an example of Ben Franklin. For more than an hour, Wedderburn just goes on a complete rant against Franklin. Franklin is shocked that not one of the 36 lords present called for Wedderburn to return to the original reason, reason for the hearing. Instead, Franklin said, quote, they seem to enjoy highly the entry and frequently burst out in loud applauses. Franklin stood motionless for an hour, taking words of abuse along with howls and laughter and jeers from the spectators. He's dressed in a suit, and I'm actually jealous of this, spotted Manchester velvet. Couldn't find one on uh, Amazon for today, but I'll still look. However, when Wedderburn goes quiet, 
and calls Ben Franklin as a witness, Franklin says, I have nothing to say. The Privy Council official recordings show that, quote, Dr. Franklin being present remained silent, but declared by his counsel that he did not choose to be examined, unquote. At the same hearing, the Privy Council also found the petition to remove Hutchinson and Oliver invalid, but they wouldn't just state a simple rejection. What they do is the official reason for the rejection was, quote, that the said petition founded upon resolutions found, formed upon false and erroneous allegations and that the scene is groundless, vexatious, and scandalous and calculated only for the seditious purpose of keeping up a spirit of clamor and discontent in the said province, unquote, talking about Massachusetts. The following day, Franklin is fired as postmaster general. He leaves Great Britain, leaves England, and he is now all in for independence. When Franklin's illegitimate, illegitimate son, William, who was arrested during the Revolutionary War for being a loyalist royal governor of New Jersey, Franklin refuses to try to get him released, and they basically stay estranged for the rest of their lives. During the peace treaty talks in Paris, Franklin plays hardball about his firm, quote, no amnesty or compensation, unquote, stand against loyalists who fled the colonies. As the peace treaty is being signed to end the Revolutionary War on September 3rd, 1783, does anybody want to guess what suit Franklin wears to the signing? He wears the same Manchester velvet suit that he had worn the day he had been abused by Wedderburn before the Privy Council. So great stuff. We, we can go on and on about Franklin. There's so much here, but I just wanted to pick a couple of examples. But the next person I would like to talk about is Franklin's wife, Deborah Reed Franklin. So Deborah is, she plays an important role, much like the other women in the revolution, is that she takes on Franklin's various businesses to allow Franklin to go to London. By doing so, Franklin's, Franklin can be involved in national and state politics, correct? Um, the two, she is the second of seven children. She received little formal education and almost nothing is known about her childhood. In 1723, Ben runs away from Boston and ends up in Philly, where he meets Deborah Reed. Deborah Reed. Um, she, he actually becomes a boarder in the Reed household. Ben and Deborah grow closer. She begins to suggest that they should get married. And Franklin is saying, well, I'm not so sure. He was unsure what to do. What does he do? He leaves for Great Britain. Franklin rarely wrote her while he was gone. In 1725, Deborah Reed's mother persuades her to marry another guy, John Rogers, who was a local potter in Philly, but ends uh, pretty quickly. There were rumors that Rogers actually had another wife in Great Britain. 1729, Franklin returns to Philly. He buys Pennsylvania Gazette and turns it into the most successful colonial newspaper. His newspaper contains the first political cartoons. Franklin asks Deborah to marry him, but she said that a new marriage was out of the question as long as there was a chance that Rogers, her first husband, might reappear. On the 1st of September, 1730, they enter into a common law marriage. Deborah does not share many of Ben's beliefs. She was uncomfortable, very similar to, to Martha Washington, uncomfortable in social situations. She enjoys being a 
homemaker. She really enjoys running his businesses. While Ben runs the printing business, she's in charge of, they both had a book and stationery shop as well as a general store. Because of her assistance, Franklin is able to retire early and for a bulk of his life is able to devote himself to public life and politics and such. It allows him to spend years in Europe without her. In 1773, she begins experiencing health problems. Franklin is in Great Britain at the time. He's trying to keep peace between the British and the colonies. Her fear of ocean voyages keeps her from traveling back and forth. She dies unexpectedly of a stroke in December of 1774 while Franklin is in Great Britain. So that is, and again, the biggest thing that Deborah does here is that she helps run businesses so Franklin can be involved elsewhere. We're going to end with Deborah in September of 1775. 22-year-old Deborah Champion of New London, Connecticut, is asked by her father, Henry, a Continental Army Commissary General, to deliver messages to Washington in Boston. Deborah rides on horseback with the family slave as her escort. She crosses enemy lines into Massachusetts. She hid the messages for Washington under the bodice of her dress and fastened her neckerchief over the bodice. Her mother said, you should wear a silk hood, which fits snugly and hid Deborah's features, making her look like an, a much older woman, which allowed her to pass over British lines easily. Deborah was able to deliver the messages to Washington. And again, it's, it's, it's a quick uh, discussion of Deborah, but what it, it really allows or what it illustrates are the smaller contributions that everyday citizens made during the war, which collectively add to the colonies beating the British. So we are at 1243, we're gonna end here. I wanted to let everybody know, first, thank you for joining, joining us. Happy birthday, John Milius. Starting Monday, these presentations will be shown on a History for Shut-Ins Facebook page. You will have access to all tape presentations there, and then live presentations will be shown there. The page will be up and running this afternoon, and I will publish it on my Facebook page and send out invites to you all. Thank you all for joining. If you have any questions, leave them here, and I will answer uh, before our next session. But we'll pick up on Monday at noon, and we will talk about Molly Pitcher, the truth and the legend. So thanks all. Stay safe. Have a great, great weekend. Take care.